Lord, that's all that you do for us. We're thankful for this little church, and Lord, we pray that you bless it, help it to grow, help us to do what you have us to do in this community. Lord, we pray for our pastor and ask you to be with him tonight, give him the words, and the uh, uh, ability to, to think and to speak what you have him to speak. Let the Holy Ghost preside over this church. Lord, let him have his will and way as we come to worship and honor and glorify you. We do pray for our sick, Lord, that you touch and heal and bless. You know the need for all that's sick. We pray, Lord, and for our country that you be with it, helping it to turn away from its wicked ways, that you would heal our country once again. And Lord, we want you to reach the lost, Lord. Uh, we pray that you'd help us to be that uh, instrument in your uh, arsenal that you would uh, be able to send us where you'd have us to go and tell the people about you, and Lord, that you work on the other end on the heart. And uh, have them to open their heart up to Jesus and accept Him as their Savior. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ron. Okay, we're going to open our hymnals. You may remain seated, and we're going to sing "Sweet By and By," and we're going to sing it sweet. Okay, before we go bye bye tonight. Okay, so let's sing Sweet Bye Bye real sweet. Okay, page 504. 504. <clears throat> Peace. 
It will help us every day. It will brighten all the way. It will keep on the sunny side of life. Isn't that pretty good? So uh, let's keep that in mind and let's try to have a very sunny, sunny week and sunny disposition this week, okay? Now we're gonna go ahead and have prayer again real quickly for the sermon and also for these requests we mentioned this morning. Jimmy and Linda's daughter, Connie Woods, keep her in prayer. Angelina had a real rough evening last uh, night. So continue to pray for her, pray for Carolyn and Billy. They've also had a difficult time. And we're uh, <clears throat> praying for Susan Smith, Susan Cardwell Smith. She's lost another family member and is also going through some health issues as well. Then we have the young man, Warren, that we prayed for this morning that has only 10% of the usage of his heart so he's praying and uh, waiting on a transplant. So let's keep those in prayer uh, as we go uh, to the Lord tonight. Let's pray again. Father, bless now as we open your word and as we begin this part of the service and we lift these requests to you. Thank you for Ron's prayer earlier and we just add this to his prayer and lift all of these requests to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so you snooze, you lose. Kathy, do you still have a guess that you want to guess? Mark. What? Mark chapter 13, verse 36. Well, what's the topic? Less coming, it's about the coming of Christ. What it's is it? About the second coming of Christ. 
where they were I can't hear you. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Oh, okay, okay. So Jesus saying, lest he come and find you sleeping. Very good guess. You have any others? Um, Donna, did you have one? Was that some slip and Delilah cut off his hair? Oh, he did snooze and lose, didn't he? <laughs> Samson <laughs> slept and lost his hair. Any other guesses? Okay, those are really, really good guesses, and I hope the folks that have been watching on Facebook would guess before we let the cat out of the bag, so to speak. But uh, uh, I want you to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 20. Acts, chapter 20. Now, we've heard this campaign, booze it or lose it, right? And that's uh, to curtail drunk driving. And we have click it or ticket, and that's to curtail or to encourage the use of seat belts. So tonight's topic, you snooze, you lose. So the, the answer is found in Acts chapter 20. Of course, those that you mentioned are all very, very good. Plus, I think Kathy had mentioned earlier the disciples sleeping while Jesus was praying. So that was real good as well. But what we're going to look at tonight, see if you can see this with me as we read along, and then we'll get into the message for you this evening. In Acts chapter 20, we're just going to begin in verse 7. But I want you to note, though, that later on there is a great revival, there is a great a move of God's Holy Spirit. And this little portion of scripture is wedged in between verse six and that great movement beginning in verses 14. So we're gonna look at this little story here. Now, uh, Luke is known as the person who wrote for the apostle Paul, at least most of the book of Acts. So Luke is writing here so that he can give a complete story about the, not only the, uh, ministry of Jesus Christ, but also the ministry of the apostles of Jesus as well. So notice verse seven, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, which is really a common term for having communion, Paul preached to them, ready to depart on the morrow. Now it's evening and he's going to leave on the next day and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third law and was taken up dead. You see him snoozing and losing? That's awful, isn't it? And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, trouble not yourself for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and had eaten and talked a long while, look at this, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. That means they were greatly encouraged. And we went before to ship and sailed to Assos, there intending to take in Paul, for so he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. So when we look at this passage, notice that it takes place on Sunday afternoon. So you could be happy that you're in church tonight. Many, many people have given up going to a church uh, on worship on Sunday night. It's just really too inconvenient for most people anymore to go much more than one time a week. And for many, many people, it's so inconvenient for people to go more than just Easter and Christmas. We know how that is, right? But I'm just glad that you're here tuning in tonight uh, for the Sunday night service, that you're here uh, physically able to sh share together in the fellowship we have, not with not only with the singing, but with one another's presence and with the word of God. So when we look at this here, 
uh, this assembly that took place at this particular time is probably not much different than what would assemble today other than the fact back then they had this amazing desire for the word of God and they just couldn't seem to get it up. Now I know you've heard of missionaries who would talk about how people would walk days to get to a service when they heard that there was going to be a missionary preaching a sermon. And many times those missionaries would preach and they would have to open the windows if they had windows because the crowds of people gathered around them wanted to hear the man of God deliver the word of God to them. But we find in America, people have grown very, very cold to worshiping God. They are not participating in worshiping God and serving God as once they used to, even in this great land. And that's a sad, sad commentary on the part of the church. But in this assembly, this young man is named Eutychus. He was sitting in a window. He fell out of the window. He hit the ground and died instantly, but then was brought back to life. So here we're talking about Paul's sermon. Obviously, we could give this many funny titles, the sermon that cost the life of a parishioner. How about that one, you know? Or Paul murderer in the church, we could say that. Or Paul's sermon kills people. So that any way you want to look at it, it's kind of humorous in a sense, but when you look at this, it's amazing that we think about how the Holy Spirit had uh, put this in this particular uh, portion of Scripture. Now let me stop here and tell you this little story. There was an old-time pastor that uh, used to get annoyed with people nodding their head when, when uh, he would preach and they'd sometimes fall off to sleep. So he had this uh, deacon that would stand in the back and if he saw someone nodding off in the church while he was preaching, he had this big long stick like a club and he would kind of tap him on the shoulder and wake him up when the preacher was preaching. Well, the preacher was up preaching one night and he just kept preaching and preaching and preaching and finally this guy nodded off and he started snoring. Well, the guy would shake him and he would wake up and then he would go back to snoring again and he would hit him and then the next time he hit him, he didn't move. And then he hit him again and he didn't move. Finally, he hit him real hard and he opened his eyes. He said, hit me again, I can still hear him. And so when we think about that, it's kind of humorous, but I wanna warn you tonight that if you fall asleep during one of my sermons in the church and you end up dying, you better remember that I am not the Apostle Paul. There's nothing I can do for you, I'm afraid. The best advice I can give you during one of my sermons is just stay away. But look, in Romans 15, 4, Paul says this, and I love this scripture because it helps us to know and understand a little bit about the word of God. Paul said in Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. So we know that Paul says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable to us. And here he says that we can learn from all scripture that it gives us hope. So now let's ask ourselves why or what possible reason could the Holy Spirit have placed this episode of this story. Now this is kind of embarrassing maybe to Paul. And it may have been embarrassing to the young man after he was brought back to dead. He said, what happened? He said, you fell asleep when Paul was preaching. And so that could have been rather embarrassing. So how can we get some practical lessons from this uh, story tonight? Now, uh, some preachers I know would want to stay here and preach on uh, the fact that people just need to stay awake during church. And they really do. But when you look at this, we have to ask ourselves, how is this portion of scripture practical to me? How can I apply it to my life? What can I glean from this? And I can tell you there's probably many, many applications of this story that we could apply to our life, but I'm gonna focus on one in just a few moments. Now, when we think about this again, uh, we notice that it was Sunday evening that Paul began to preach Sunday afternoon and he preached until midnight. And then after he raised the guy from the dead, he preached until break of day. That's a long sermon, isn't it? 
I mean, can you imagine trying to stay awake during the sermon that long? Especially if the night before, you know how it is on Saturday, don't you? You're worn out on Saturday, and if you don't get a lot of rest on Saturday, it's hard to stay awake. And I can tell you, I used to work third shift and try to go to church Sunday morning, and I had to make myself stay awake. It, wasn't, it didn't matter if it was kids singing or the preacher preaching. I just had a hard time staying awake. But I can't imagine now this young man, maybe what he had gone through Saturday to make him so, so sleepy. And then when we think about the fact that this room was in the upper chamber and they had to light it with maybe oil lights, something of that nature. So it may have been very hot and stuffy and hard to breathe. And so this young man kind of perched himself at a window where he could breathe some fresh air and at the same time give an ear to Paul's preaching. And somewhere along the line, his body gave up on him and he fell into a deep sleep. And there he goes, he's bobbing, he's bobbing, then he falls out. The next thing you know, he leans over and before he, he can even catch himself, he falls to his death. And so that's how our story goes. So why would Luke, Put this story in here. Now, when you think of the Apostle Paul, here's some other topics for you. If we could take some of the topics of the Bible that are very interesting, but these in the book of Acts, let me run through a list of these. What about Paul's conversion? Wasn't that an exciting thing to talk about in the book of Acts, how Paul was converted to Jesus Christ and how he fell off his horse and, uh, and became blind and then he encountered Jesus? And then we think about the churches that Paul helped to start throughout his ministry as he preached, uh, not only through Jerusalem, but to other parts of Rome, to Asia Minor. And then we think about how that when Paul did preach in certain places, they cast him out of some of the cities. Sometimes they would stone him and leave him for dead. Sometimes he was chased by wild animal. Many times he was, he was beaten with rods. He was shipwrecked. And then he said, night and day I spent in the deep. And then you think about the time that he was on this island and a poisonous serpent came out and bit his hand and he didn't die. So when you look at all of those exciting things of all that Paul had done, of all the sacrifices he had made, of all that he had contributed to the ministry of Jesus Christ and the preaching of the gospel, we have the story, just a few verses of Eutychus who died in uh, one of Paul's services. So let's look at this, and I want you to keep this in mind. Death is not the end. Death is not the end. Eutychus did die, and he was very, very blessed to have had the Apostle Paul present when he did die, because the Apostle Paul came down and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I don't know how he did this, but he raised him back to life again, comforted him. Maybe they all smiled at one another. He said, son, you want to go home and get some rest? He said, no, Paul, I want to stay and listen to the rest of your sermon. Well, that may have fired Paul up. So what he does is he goes back to preaching and preaches several more hours. Now, Sometimes people complain when they come in at 11 o'clock that the preacher goes much past 12. I know Kathy's back there saying this all the time or pointing at a watch, you know. But uh, can you imagine preaching from uh, sometime in late afternoon, maybe four or five o'clock, into the evening, all the way to midnight, and then having a little break to raise the dead and then continue to preach till dawn? What a sermon. You know, one day when we get to heaven, we're probably going to get to hear that sermon, and, and I believe we'll be able to stay awake in our glorified body. So look at verse 7 through 8. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight, and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. Now, it's not difficult to imagine someone falling to sleep, and it's really not difficult 
to imagine someone falling to sleep and actually falling to their death. It probably had happened a lot of times. And this was the last night of Paul's uh, preaching in the city of Troas, and he wanted to share all he could with his beloved friends before he took this journey. And his sermon was very, very long, a lot longer, listen to me, a lot longer than 20 minutes, so keep that in mind. Don't be too critical of me when Paul preached about seven or eight hours there. But then as he's preaching late into the night and the room where Paul was preaching was crowded and the atmosphere was stuffy and people had probably eaten earlier and, and now they were kind of fighting sleep, that's when this episode happened. So in verse nine, it says here, there sat in the window a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, I can't help but smile at that, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third law and was taken up dead. So notice that he fell down from the third law. So that was probably the highest part in the upper chambers. There's no telling how high this was, but can you imagine a three-story building and you being on the, the third floor and you falling, you would hurt yourself, wouldn't you? But this young man didn't only hurt himself, but he killed himself uh, as he fell out the window. And notice it says very clearly that he was taken up dead. Do you see that? So he did snooze and he did lose. Now, can I ask you something? If you had to choose the way that you would die, is this such a bad way to die, listening to a sermon? I mean, really, it's not that bad, is it? It's not that awful if God were to take you during one of the preacher's sermons. Uh, so this young man died, and he was taken in this way. But let's think about what he may have been doing before his death. You know, he had been doing what, folks? He had been attending worship service, had he not? He had been fellowshipping with God's people. He was in the company of a lot of great men and women, and he had been listening to the word of God. So can there be any better way to die than die while you're listening to the word of God? Or even if you're reading the word of God in your easy chair at home, and then God says, I'm ready to take you, and you die right there, and they come and find you, and there your head is slumped over your Bible, and your hand is laying on the place, where you were reading and people said, oh, look at that, isn't that wonderful? He died while, or she died while reading the word of God. What a wonderful thing to think about. And I've heard some preachers say that if I die, if God would let me, I want to die while preaching a sermon, see? And so I can understand that, but what better way to die and place to die than listening to the word of God in the fellowship of God's people? Now, when we think about that, uh, choosing to spend time in church doesn't automatically make me a Christian, does it? No. Choosing to be in the company of God's people doesn't make me a Christian. Someone has said that you can, uh, just because you turn a bicycle into a garage doesn't make it become a car. You know, you can bring a person into a church building and unless there's been a change in their heart, they're going to leave the same way they came in, except maybe a little bit more hardened of heart. So when we think about that, it's not that going to church made him something special. It wasn't that uh, listening to Paul's sermon made him something special. In fact, I can go to church all my life. And the only thing that's going to help me is going to be when I apply the things that I hear while being in God's church. If I hear a sermon and just let it go in one ear and out the other, if I hear a sermon and do not take care of the things in my life, James calls me a foolish man. He tells me I need to be a hearer, of, not just a hearer of the word, but a doer also. So when we think about that, uh, even a preacher preaching the sermon of God doesn't necessarily mean that if he dies that moment, everything's going to be okay between him and the Lord. He could have died in many different ways. You think about that. Suppose you die 
uh, he died listening to a sermon. But suppose you die and the last thought in your mind was how you hated that first or second cousin of yours. Or how you were angry and you didn't say anything, but maybe you thought a bad thought when that person cut you off in the traffic. Suppose when you, you die, there's something going on in your heart and mind that isn't just right at that time. That would be a terrible thing to stand before the Lord with, wouldn't it? It would be rather embarrassing. And we never know when God's going to take us home. But we had better always be walking in fellowship with him. And if I were to have a heart attack right now what, while I'm preaching to you right now, uh, I would say to you that God is not going to say, L.C., I was so proud of you, I thought I'd take you home. You know, when all along God may have known how I struggled to just stand up here and share this with you to make some sense or meaning out of God's word in this particular passage of scripture. So a person isn't automatically, uh, immediately right with God in every aspect just because they're in attendance at God's house or reading his word. We have got to get our heart right with God. Now, I can't speak to Eutychus' heart, but I can tell you this, that if we have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, that doesn't mean that in this life we will be perfect. It does mean that through his shed blood, we have perfect redemption through him. And God tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And what he wants us to do is be in the habit as long as we're consciously able to confess our sins so that we stay in clean and pure fellowship with God. Now notice down in verse 10. Now, uh, it doesn't say here exactly how Paul uh, brought this young man back to life again, because we know in the Bible many times there's just touching, there's a, the breathing upon them, there's all types of things that we've seen Jesus do to heal people, and uh, there's words that might be said. But we know that in verse 10 it says here, Paul went down and fell on him. You see that? Embracing him. And he says, trouble not yourself, for his life is in him. Now, remember a moment ago that I said that we're all going to die. God is the author of our death. He decides when we live and when we die. He allows us to come into this world, and he's the one that will take us out when he's ready for us. But I love these words here. He says, trouble not yourself. Do you realize that for some reason, God had a purpose in Eutychus falling out that window? He didn't push him out. He didn't make him fall. He didn't kill him. But he allowed Eutychus to fall into deep sleep so that Paul obviously could do a miracle which would enhance his own ministry and confirm more assuredly that he was an apostle of God. But Paul said to the people concerned with him, Trouble not yourself. Now I wonder why Paul would say this. Have you ever thought about when someone dies, especially some young man that has all of his life ahead of him? Why did God allow that young man to die? Why did God take that young man into church service? Why couldn't God have awakened him and allowed him to be conscious enough to grab hold? You know, and sometimes people are even angry with God at God allowing death to happen, aren't they? See, but God has a right. Again, he brought us into this world and he can take us out of this world. But Paul said these words, let not your heart be troubled. So Paul is comforting these people. And before he brings him back to life again, he says, don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. Don't be concerned. Now, believer to believer, I've done this in many funerals. I would say, let not your heart be troubled. 
You believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus said. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare that place for you, I'll return again and receive you unto myself. But it starts with saying, let not your heart be troubled. And even when Mary and Martha lost Lazarus, Jesus had to comfort them, says that he's going to live again. And I am the resurrection and the life. So I can say to you, upon the authority of God's word, just like Paul could say to these people, you're going to see this young man again. If not in this life, you'll see him in the life to come. One day you'll be able to put your arm around him again and miss your loved one that you're thinking about at this moment. One day you're going to be able to hug them. One day you're going to be able to hold them. One day you're going to be able to smile at them. You're going to be able to maybe pat them on the back or scratch them on their head, whatever it is that you used to love to do when that person was alive. You're going to hear the voice again. Those eyes that you used to look into, you're going to look into them again. You're going to hear their voice again because we believe just as Jesus promised us that this life is not all there is, that if we trust in Jesus Christ, the gift that he gives to us is eternal life, eternal life. So Eutychus fell down from the window, and even though the congregation may have been questioning why, Paul said he's going to be okay. But then he preached more and more that evening into early morning. I wonder what he preached about. And I'm sure that he used that miracle as a springboard to what else he was going to say. And as I said, when you get home, you read Acts 20, and you'll find that this led to a great movement of the Holy Spirit. And how God used this young man, we we'll probably won't know all the answers to that this side of heaven. But this is an interesting take on it, isn't it? Think about this, that everyone, unless the rapture takes place, is going to die. But even when the rapture takes place, we're going to be changed and we'll be like Jesus Christ. And even though God has saved us and redeemed us and his blood has cleansed us and continues to cleanse us, we still need to make sure that we are in fellowship with him through the confessing of our sins on a regular basis. And then should we die in this life or should a loved one die, let's remember and praise God for the fact that if that person died in Christ, we will see that loved one again. And all the more reason that if we're not sure that a person is in Christ, that we share the gospel with them while there is still time. Well, I hope that was a blessing to you. Let's stand and we'll dismiss you tonight in prayer. I think Eutychus was a very, very blessed young man having Paul that are present and being able to bring him back to life. But I think we're all blessed, aren't we? Yeah. That Jesus died on the cross for us, that he took our place, that we don't have to face hell because of his death, burial, and resurrection. We have the hope of eternal life. I pray that this will be a blessing to you as you think about it in the future as well. Ron, will you dismiss us in prayer? Dear Lord, we do come again thankful for this time. Lord, that you uh, let us hear your word. And Lord, uh, may we 